Okay. Would you tell me your complete name, please? My name is Pincus Colando. I was born February the 8th, 1926, in Bochnia, Poland. Bochnia is about 40 to 50 kilometer from Krakow. Okay. Would you tell me a little bit about the city, Bochnia, that you Bochnia lived in? was about a population of about 30,000 people. 10,000 were Jewish population, 10,000. Okay, and how were the Jews treated in your city? Well, we talk before the war. Before the war. Well, there was always anti-Semitism, but we managed, somehow we managed. It was a very thriving city, it had a lot of synagogues, shuls, shtiblach, and schools, Hebrew schools, yeshivas. It was a very thriving city. Did you go to a school designed yes, for Jewish? Yes, I went, I went to yeshiva and I went to school. Half I divided in the afternoon we went to school and in the morning we went to the yeshiva. How might the people in your village, your city have treated Jews that were different from other Polish people? Uh, you mean who? Uh, How did they treat you that you were prejudiced against? Well, the Pol this, there were no other Polish people always been prejudiced against the Jewish people. Were there well, things you were not allowed to do because you were Jewish? Well, uh, there's certain businesses Jews could not, uh, couldn't get like, I remember my father applied for a, he was a veteran, Poli he served in the army during the World War I and he applied for a business and he couldn't get it because he was Jewish. Did they state that as a reason, or you just They didn't knew? state it. They didn't state it. Everything, but we knew it was, that was the reason. Okay. What was your family like? Who were the, what did your father we were, do? We were a family of five, two brothers, sister. My father was an accountant, irony. My father was also an accountant. Renee's father was also an accountant until World, World War II. Yeah, he was a certified accountant. And what kind of business did he work in? Uh, for a closing store. The closing, glo uh, closing store. Mm -hmm. This was till 1938. Then by 1938, the anti-Semitism was so strong. Yeah, my father had a beard. He was a religious Jew. So the owner of the business required from him to shave it off, and he wouldn't do it. So I remember he lost the job. And he went into a grocery store. I opened up a grocery business in 1938. Did he continue the grocery business yeah, until till the war, till 1940? What were your, was your family life like? What kinds of things did you? Well, do? we had a good life. Of very, uh, I can't complain. As far we had a good youth and. My father was very religious. We always kept Saturday. The business was closed on Saturdays. We went to shul. It was a very good life, I would say, till till the war. As a child, I, I can remember, still remember those good things from from before the war. It's a good family life. When the war came to Poland, yeah. what could you tell us yes, what you remember? Then, by 1939, everything stopped. Hell broke loose. First of all, all the schools were closed, for, uh, forbidden for Jewish kids. So we couldn't go to school. All the synagogues, everything was closed. And the businesses, I remember 1940, we had, they came, we had to close our business. Jews weren't allowed to have any businesses. So. What did your family do once the business was closed? Well, uh, it was tough, very, t very rough, very, very bad. It was hard to get food and they had no money, but somehow we managed till 1942. Did you sell your possessions or? We couldn't sell it. You see, they put right in 1940, they put us into a ghetto. Fortunately for us, we didn't have to move because our house where we lived was in the ghetto, so, so we didn't have to move. But all the Jews from the outside who lived in the suburban and suburbs, they had to move in into the ghetto. 
Could you tell us a little bit about your life when you were in the ghetto? <coughs> well, 1940. First thing, we had to go to work. All the children, not children, men from 15 till 55. It was by forced labor. We had to register and we had to report for labor. So I remember we worked. The Germans came for us, several hundred people that came with trucks. We had to leave 6 o'clock in the morning. We had to work, build highways, dig ditches, all this kind of hard labor. But at least we came back in the evening. We came back to our homes. So that was from 40 till 42. I was constantly on forced labor. Who would have been the guards in your ghetto? At the, the ghettos, well, inside was the Jewish police, the ordinance police, what they call them. For the, at work, we had German civilians. We didn't have, at that time, there was no military, just mainly civilians who, took, who watched us. They were under guard. Now, what might the people who stayed home during the day, what was their life like in the ghetto? In the ghetto? Well, the constant fear, and never, never knew the insecurity, and never knew what's going to happen. We knew something's going to happen, but we couldn't go nowhere. We were trapped, you know, simple. There was no way to go. We just had to hope for the best. Did you, could you go in and out of the ghetto freely? No, I was in the ghetto, the ghettos were sealed. If you had to go out in the, in the Gent Ar Aryan neighborhood, either you had to have a pass or something or with a, with a policeman, but it was forbidden. As a matter of fact, if you went, if they caught you without any, without any passport or something, you were shot really, on the spot. All the food and supplies were brought in by Brought the in. Everything was, no, it was smuggled in. There was going a lot of smuggling going in at night. That's the only way we got our food. We smuggled in for the, through the Polish neighborhood. For, for we paid uh, quite a bit. They paid a big price for it. What was the religious life like in the ghetto? Well, uh, in the ghetto, everything had to be done secretly. We still went to shul. We had, we had not in the shul. We had at homes. We always had to watch outside of, because it was forbidden to assemble. Any more than six or eight people cannot be, the Germans forbid to get assembled. So we had services morning and evenings. We always had a lookout to watch if the Germans don't come in. So when, they, when we heard some Germans coming, we just, everybody dispersed. So they didn't, wouldn't see us. Did people start disappearing from the ghetto? Yes, a lot of people, because a lot of people went out at night to get some food from the farmers and everything, and, and anybody was caught, they were shot, and we remember used, every day used to bring in dead corpse to take it to get the people who were caught in the outside, outside the ghetto. And you were responsible for burying them? Yeah, we had the Jewish community had to go bury them. What, where did the people who came from the smaller cities, where did from they the old, From the surrounding area, yes. yes, they all came in, put them into the ghetto, into Bochnia. That was the main ghetto right there. What did you did ask Did you me? have to accommodate them in your houses, or how did you? Well, the Jewish community, there was a Judenrat. They had, you know, the Jewish council, they called it the Judenrat. And they were responsible for those people. They had to supply them with uh, make arrangements for apartments, way to live, and so forth. Of course, they put in the whole families in one room. There was very shortage of apartments. So people lived like, like animals, like dogs, 10, 15 people to a room. Couldn't and help it. Was there quite a bit of community spirit trying to help other people? Yes, yeah, that's the reason. Uh, yes, it was quite a community spirit. It's the wealthy one, the people had some money helped them. I remember in the ghetto, we had, by 1940, we had to give up the, the, the grocery store. We opened up a restaurant, small restaurant, so we helped out a lot of people. 
We didn't have to eat anything. We used to come in and we used to feed them because we had a little bit more than they had. Did the Jewish council exist before the ghetto was no. established? Uh, during the ghetto, 1940, the Jewish ghetto. They, they, start, they, they arranged it, Judenrat, in 1940. Okay. Did you see things starting to change in the ghetto as time went on? Uh, yes. Yes, not everything was changed. First of all, there was no food available, and we didn't have the freedom. We, we just we cooped in a small ghetto, thousands of people, and, and just three or four blacks. So you can imagine how how crowded things were. When did the ghetto um, become unestablished? When did they I believe it? it was in 1940. I couldn't tell. It was my I think it was in winter. I remember it was cold when the when the when the Germans came in and they gave the orders all the people to move in into the ghetto. So it was about 1940 in winter. I couldn't give you exactly the date. And anyway. when did they close that ghetto? Right when they, once they put got in all the people into the ghetto, then they closed it. Put in they had gates and military police and Jewish police. The Judenrat were inside and they had German. I think it was Polish police were outside watching the ghetto. Okay. And then eventually you left the ghetto? We went, what do you mean? Uh, we went to work. We had to go out to the gate, yeah. I was there till 1942. Okay. What happened in 1942? In 1942, the Germans, this start, they came in and took out uh, Auschwitz. For the, the first group, I think, went to Treblinka. I remember that. And they got my sister at that time. I was still in the they go, They had a quarter, so many people, so they grabbed so many people. And I was, 19, by the end of 1942, I was taken with my brother to Auschwitz. Okay. What became of your parents? Okay. My mother was shot right into the, in the ghetto. It was 1942. As a matter of fact, that is September. It was September the 1st or the 2nd. She, they, uh, the, all the elderly people, they didn't want, only the young ones. They picked the young ones. And the older ones, it was a few hundred people. They couldn't use them, so they just executed them right there in front of us. Of us. So my mother was shot right there on the spot. And my brother and myself, we went to Auschwitz. I was with my brother the whole time till 1945. What happened to your brother? <clears throat> Unfortunately, when the 1945 in January, when the Russian offensive started, I know you're familiar with the history. And when the German, when the Russians came close to Auschwitz, the Germans came and they took us all out. We marched further west away from, from the Russians. We marched the whole night. I remember we marched from Auschwitz to Gleiwitz. It's about 70 miles. And my brother kept saying to me, let's escape. And I kept telling him, do not escape. Now, this is not the time because I knew it's still German territory. And I said, if you escape, where are you going to hide? The population are, uh, are not friendly. They are all Germans. But it's something, I don't know, he just kept constantly. And suddenly I didn't see him anymore. And since then I lost him. I was there the whole time in Auschwitz. When, when you left the ghetto, how did you leave we from the they ghetto? They put us on trains. They put us on trains, cattle trains packed us 100 to 120 people into a, into a wagon, sealed. And fortunately, we, didn't, we weren't too far from Auschwitz. So it took us only about two days. So most people, two days. But I know some trains from further east took seven, eight days. So you can imagine closed wagon. Most of them didn't, didn't make it even to Auschwitz. But from us, it was only two days of a trip to Auschwitz. 
Okay, was any food or? <laughs> no, I mean on the train, no, nothing, no, no food. When you got to the camp, when we what? got to Auschwitz, I remember we had to undress completely naked, and they put us. We used it. I remember this is the. If you, if you can see this. This, this is the gate before Auschwitz. Sorry, this. I know you see here. Right there, this is before the gate. We had to line up there before that gate. And I remember Mengele was there. You had that famous doctor. And we had to line up in five, and he was pointing left, right, right, left, right, left. And I was fortunate. I went put to the right. And the one to the left, they went to the crematorium. The one to the right went, went into the camp in Auschwitz. Was that your only encounter with Mengele? Yes, that's the only one. I didn't even know the name, but later on, when, we, when I heard about him, I remember the looks of him. I, that was him. Okay. Once you went in the line that said you were going to live, then we... We didn't know that. We didn't know that. But we had an, I had an idea when I could see, it was dark, but I could see the people to the left were mostly elderly people and young children. So I had an uh, inkling that we got into the camp. And they put us into the camp when we got there. First of all, they shaved our, our hair. Took a, we were stark naked. And they tattooed us. You see it right now? I have 161, 253, the number. And, and they took us, they gave us the showers, cold showers. It was in winter, bitter cold. That was in November when we got there. And then the showers, then they put us this striped, they gave us a striped clothes, and they took, uh, took us into Birkenau. This is the camp. And the Birkenau was a, actually was a camp. It, it, was a, the, a, it was not a labor camp. Anybody, if you couldn't live there longer than four weeks. Fortunately for us, we've been there only four weeks. It was a transition camp. That's what it is. After four weeks, I was fortunate to pick several hundred men to the next camp to Buna, which was about 10, 10 miles further. And it, that was a little better camp. It was more a labor camp which we worked and gave us a little bit of food, and the barracks were a little nicer and so on. Would you describe the living conditions there, what the barracks were like? Okay, the barracks, I would say there was about three or four hundred men to a barrack. We had double, triple banks, bunks. They looked like this. I brought the picture when I was after the war. See the banks? triple banks, and that's what we live, uh, each one had, I say, his assignment, you know. The banks were actually single banks and two people had to sleep on it. It was bitter cold in the barracks, and we had to get up five o'clock in the morning, and the, the way they, they came in the copper, so you know what a copper is? Copper where there's uh, like the oil, uh, they were in charge of the barracks. Most of them were criminals. They weren't Jews. They were mostly Germans, Poles, and some Jews they were mostly criminals. And they, were, they gave them the assignment to take care of us. And they used to beat us. That's the way, only in the morning and the evening, in order, you know, to get us, to, to scare us, not to make any revolts, or, you know, to, to be quiet. That's the way they, they treated us there. And what did you have to eat? Uh, in the morning, used to give us one portion of bread. It was mostly mixed with sawdust. It's, it was very heavy. It looked when you took, but it was mixed flowers mixed with sawdust. You wouldn't believe it, with sawdust. And a piece of margarine which, and a cup of coffee. Coffee was not real coffee, it was uh, substitute coffee, no sugar. 
<coughs> and that's this what you got in the morning. You had to work till in the evening. In the evening, you get a quart of soup. If you were fortunate, you might sometimes you had a few potatoes and a piece of meat. If you were lucky, if you mix it up, good. And most of the time, it's just hot water and a few potatoes. And uh, for that, you had to work almost ten, nine to ten hours a day. What kind of work did you do? <coughs> the first time when we came there, we had to we worked to unload gravel from trains and coals. This I remember the first few weeks of this kind of work. It is to assign four men to a train to a wagon, and they give you so much you had to finish it by then. And if you didn't finish it, you get it. You, you got a beating. So it was you, you couldn't. You couldn't just sit out and say, no, well, I'm not going to do it, because if you didn't do it, you didn't finish your job, <laughs> you, you got a terrible beating from the coppers. So. And then did you continue with that the whole time you were there? <coughs> I continued it uh, for quite a while. I do remember in Auschwitz, you know, and to survive in Auschwitz, you had to get a break. My break came, I remember the first few months was, I, I knew I just wouldn't make it. The things was, the, it was bitter cold. You know, the hunger, you can survive. You can with hunger you, for a long time. But the worst thing was the cold. It was bitter cold. And they didn't give you a head. One striped jacket, no sweater, just an undershirt. In, a, in an overcoat, a striped overcoat, which was very thin. And for that, with that, you had to stay outside, which was often 10 to 15 below zero, in bitter cold. People just froze to that. And that was the, actually the main culprit. I find that Auschwitz, the main thing, the worst enemy was the cold. Then, naturally, was the hunger. And then was the, the beating. But uh, my break came. I remember I met a friend of mine. He was from my hometown, and we discussed it. So he told me, you know, this. He gave me the name. He used to. He was a friend of my family. He happened to be in Auschwitz, one of the first one. He was arrested in 1940. He was from the intelligentsia. You know, when the Germans came into Poland, the first few months, they grabbed, they arrested all the intelligentsia because they didn't want. They figured got to get rid of the intelligentsia first, because they, are, they can start a revolution, uh, you know. And he was, uh, he was in a, a professor or something, so he, they had his name. He was a good friend of my family. Fortunately, the, that man, he was sent to Auschwitz, and he was assigned in the, he survived the first, the, the first few months, and he was assigned in Auschwitz in the administration. And he told me about him, and he said he is in charge of you know, the, the, the inmates in Auschwitz, they, were, they had everything, the administration, everything it was under. They, were, they did all the work. And he happened to be a very, very high position in Auschwitz. <coughs> so I said, let me, so I went there. And when I met him, he recognized me. And I told him how the situation is, how bad it is, and so forth, if he can give me a different job. Lucky for me, and he assigned me to another job, which was indoors. He and my brother. And I think that was the first break I got in Auschwitz, because I don't think I, could, I would have survived the winter with, and with this kind of work we did before, and that was my first break. You see, that's, I survived, and I had a better job. It was indoors, which it wasn't so cold, and it wasn't so hot. And I think he saved my life. What job did you do? Well, we worked inside. We made cabinets, metal cabinets, for for the Germans, and so we, we did just mostly carry. You know, I, I was not a cabinet maker, but we did the label. You know, what's what's there. But the main thing, what it was, is indoors, because it was bitter cold in, in December, January, February, March, and our shoes was almost unbearable. So cold it was there this morning. How did the people in your barracks get along with each other? Well, to be honest with you, we were like animals. P 
people st st would steal and everybody tried to look out for himself. You could not, if you left a piece of bread, I, in five minutes it was gone. So everything has to be, uh, you have to keep it in under your tact and under your shirt. Unfortunately, it's, that is the fact of life. We were like animals, fighting, scratching, beating, anybody, we could steal from anybody, just like animals. We just lost our humanity. That's a fact. Were you in barracks with only Jewish people, or were there? No, we were a lot with Poles, too. We were Poles and mostly Jews and Poles, yeah. We had a few Germans, they political uh, prisoners. <coughs> Did they eliminate people who were in your barracks at various points? Did they take them to the death camps from your work details? Yes, we do. We did have, over a few months, we had, they call it a uh, selection. Mengele came in, but I hadn't seen him. He used to come in in the barracks, and they used to select the people who looked very skinny, they couldn't work anymore. So they had to undress, complete naked. You had to stand before for the, uh, the doctor. He looked at you, and you had to turn around. You had to stoop over. He looked at if he, he didn't see any. He saw too many bones, and you put down your number. And you had that's it. Next morning they came with trucks and picked picked all the people and put them right in the crematorium. Did you know what was happening? Yeah, we knew it. We knew it. Fortunately, I wasn't picked, but uh, I I can remember it was heartbreaking and. Some of my friends, they knew that I, he put down the number they were picked. They couldn't, and they knew they would come for them in the morning. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing. Was there any time where there was ever an attempted revolt against the Germans? Not in Buna, not where we were. As a matter of fact, there was a revolt in Birkenau. There was a Zonder commander, you know. You had about the Zonder commander, the one who did they're burning the people. They would put them in the ovens so far. They had a, made a revolt. Most of them got killed, but at least they accomplished one thing. They burned down this crematorium. But that was already by the end, by 1944, by the end of 44. We just found out, about, I, we didn't know it. I found out later what happened. Okay. Do you remember <coughs> when you were liberated? Who liberated you and what happened? Okay. When we went from Auschwitz, when they moved us out in the dead march, they put us on train, on cattle trains in Gleiwitz. That's the name of the city, which is about 70 miles from Auschwitz. And they put us on train. They took us further, deeper into Germany. They took us, we took us 10 days. They packed us about 150 people to our wagon with no food. Fortunately for us, the wagons were open, the, the wagons. So we had, everybody had his utensils, you know, with, uh, where you ate it for cup, you know. And so we did at night, when the jam, we had guards, uh, everything, but we didn't see it. We used to, I, I remember I used to have a stri uh, string, attached it to the, it's, uh, to the plate and scooped up snow, and that kept us alive, because you can, you can live without bread for a long time, but not without water, and that's what kept us alive. It was so crowded, so cramped, that little by little, every day got looser. People died, just start fighting, scratching, biting each other. We were like animals, because you know, you can't stay only one hour, two hours. You can't stand for 10 days. We actually didn't have no room to sit down. We were to stand like one next to each other. So people got actually crazy. People went crazy. And people said, and then every day, I remember, we took, at night we threw them out over the, over the wagon. When we got to Nordhausen after 10 days, there were about 20 of us so in the wagon. Mostly young, young boys like me. 
them, elder ones, they couldn't make it, they didn't survive. And when we got to Nordhausen, this was also a big concentration camp. I don't know if you know, you heard of Nordhausen? It was a concentration camp. We were there about 10 days. Then they sent us, fortunately that from Nordhausen they sent us to another camp. The name, came, name was Dora, D-O-R-A which is in the mountains, and we are the one we had we'd worked, the V1 and the V2, you heard about in the Germans, we did the work for them. We, we dug tunnels into the mountains. I remember they told us that. So we worked there for about, so that was end of January, February, March, till April, beginning of April. And then the English, came from this site. That was already in 45. So they put us again on trains and to move away from the, and we moved away. And when we went to Czechoslovakia, I remember like now, it was April the 20th, it was a Friday morning. April the 20th is Hitler's birthday. And remember the SS came and they gave us an extra piece of margarine that was in honor of the Führer. I'll never forget it. And we were in the train. Also, we were packed, about 100 to our train. And all of a sudden, we could hear sirens blowing, and American fighter planes came and st start strafing our train. Of course, they didn't know that it's prisoners. And something like instinct told me, this is your chance now, run. Because while they were strafing us, the machine, the machine gun, the train, I remember the two guards, the SS guards, they took cover right away under the train, under the wagon. And something told me instinct, run. And I jumped out the train <laughs> and ran and ran for about three miles. I remember the fighter planes. They, they strafed us. I could see people fall, and ever, no, I wasn't the only one. Several of us jumped, and people fell and got killed from the machine, and I could see the, the bullets were flying practically right to my nose. But I kept going. I said, this is my only chance. I remember all I had is shorts. I didn't even have the shirt on because it was very hot in the train. It was closed in, and you remember, I've had so many people, and barefooted. But I kept running for about three miles. Just I said, let me get away from the from the train. And I met another fella who's also escaped with me. And we closed up together and we started walking. And it was already, I remember, late uh, in the morning. We got hungry. I said, we got to do something. We can't. Can, we can, I mean, we were naked and cold, back to naked, so we saw from the distance hut, farmers. So we went into the farm, and I remember the Czechoslovakian, the farmers, they helped us a lot. They helped us a lot. They gave, me, gave us food, gave me clothes, and they gave, put in all, and kept us warm for a while, just for about a day. Unfortunately, I almost, where he gave us so much food, we were so hungry, and he gave us the wrong food. He gave us, I remember, he gave us sauerkraut and milk and bread, and, you know, and that was the wrong thing. We were skinny bones, and I remember I got so sick that night, I was spitting with blood. The farmer, and he went that night because I got high, I remember I took so sick, I knew, I, I felt, I said, oh my God, here I survived, how she's now, I'm going to die. I was so sick, blood from, uh, spitting blood, and even from the, uh, from the, from the, I, everything. I can tell you how, was, how sick I was, that high fever. He brought a doctor. I remember he gave me a shot. And the doctor risked his life, you know, we were, pre we, the Germans, if they would have caught that farmer, hiding us, he would have been executed too. And he gave us medicine, he gave us medicine, and that's the way I, I survived. But next morning, we had to leave because the Germans were searching for us. Can you imagine, it was already almost the end of the war. 
they came into the village looking for the prisoners. So the farmer found out about it. So that night, he took us into the woods, into the forest. It was not far from there, and he gave us a shovel. We dug a foxhole, or took us a deep foxhole, and gave us blankets. And we slept there for, for two weeks. Every night he brought us food till the Americans came. And May the 5th, Americans came to Czechoslovakia. The irony of it, that was the 5th Army, Patton's Army, liberated us. Five years later, I served in Patton's Army. When I came to America, I was drafted. I went back. I was also served in the 5th Army. Could you back up a little bit back to when yeah. you were f rescued in the fields by the Czechoslovakia? Yes. How did the Americans get to you, and where did you go after that? Well, that was in the village. We found out the Americans came in, so we went to, the, to Prague. That was near Prague. And we'd been there, and there were several other guys. We met other fellows, survivors. So we went to the American. I remember we went to a company there. They had bivouac. The American was a tank company. We went in there, and we asked him if we were willing to work. He said, for well, KP duty, you know KP? And they were glad to take us in, and we worked for them for four weeks. And we worked, we were glad to do the work, we, and the soldiers were happy because they didn't have to pull the KP. <laughs> so we slept with the Americans. They gave us uniforms. We had a real, and that's the way we recuperated. You'd be surprised how quickly we recuperated from 70, 80 pounds. In a month, I was already 120, 130 pounds. And yeah. where did you go once you From there, recuperated? we worked for them, and then the company, I remember, left for the United States, and we just went to Germany. We, had, we found out there's, there's a lot of uh, refugees going to Germany, so we decided we went to Germany. And well, I lived in Germany from 1945 till 1950. I applied for the visa right then. When I get to Germany, I applied for them at the American Council. It took me five years to get the visa. And I left in January 1950 for the United States. Yeah. And the same year, I was drafted in the American Army. Okay. What did you do for those five years when you were in Germany before Actually, you we didn't do nothing. We didn't do nothing. I, because you, were cons you didn't know, you, you figured any day they will call us to come to the United States. So we just sit and wait. So that was wasted five years for me. Often I think about it. That was the wasted years, but they, they couldn't do anything. Did you go back to the city that you grew up in? No, I never went back to Poland. I went back to Poland four years ago. I took my wife and my son and daughter. We went to Poland. Those are the pictures I have here, which we took from, from Auschwitz and so on. Okay. What did when you were waiting, was the, were the German people antagonistic to you, or how did they treat you? You mean during when the five years? When you were waiting in 45 to 50? Well, no. First of all, they were the defeated people, you know, and so they, why do not want the inside in their heart, they probably still hated us, but they didn't show it to us. And how did you eat and pay for things? Well, uh, we received uh, some some kind of help from the from the German government during the during the years while we were waiting for the visa. Okay, so and who were you waiting with? Who did you live with? A few more fellows. You know, we lived in a little town, and uh, it was near 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 refugee camp. We, uh, most of the people lived in DP camps, you know, those di displaced person camps, for waiting for their visas. And we lived in a little town. And every day we were hoping to get a call. And that's the reason we couldn't do anything. We didn't want to leave because I suppose you get a call from the consulate to leave. Okay. 
then in 1950 you got the call that said you could leave. What? Yes, 1950 we got. I was I got the call from the from the American consulate, and we went to Bremenhaven. They took us to Bremen. From Bremenhaven we boarded a ship. I got straight to Charleston. Got from New York to Charleston. What was it like when you came to Charleston? Well, the first few weeks, or let, I would say the first few months, was wasn't comfortable. Let's put it that way. We were lonely. I didn't know anybody in Charleston. I met my wife just several weeks, several months later, which we got acquainted. But I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any family, no relatives. I couldn't speak the language. And even a job, we couldn't get the right. It was a, a recession during the time, 1950. It was, I was very, very despondent, let's put it this way, the first six months. Then gradually, you got acquainted, you make more friends, uh, things got, got a little better. Then I was drafted in the Army, and, and the war, Korean War, broke out, I believe, in July. And I was drafted in September, and I was induced in the Army in December 1950. And I was stationed for North Carolina and Fort Bragg. I even was in Fort Jackson here, too. I was for a while. And then they sent me back to Germany for tour duty. I was stationed in Germany. Can you relate how you felt after dealing with German guards and soldiers for all that time, that here you were, a man in uniform, a soldier in Germany. Yes. How, how did that make you feel? Well, it's two different things, you know. You, 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 don't, you try to forget about it the way it was before. You just try to erase it from your mind. Simple. You just don't want to think about this. Sometimes, if you think about it, sometimes you can go crazy. It drives you nuts. Is that one of the coping mechanisms you used to... How did you make it through all those years in the camp? I feel it was the strong will to survive. Many boys my age didn't make it. They could Perhaps they could have survived, but they lost their will to live. I've seen it. That was the main thing. You had to have the strong will to survive. You had to keep it in your mind. I'm going to live. I'm going to survive, and I'm going to not live. And many boys they just often went to the fences. It was every day. You could see dozens of kids. They just went to the fences and electrocuted themselves, commit suicide. It was the easiest way out. And if you lost the will, that, that was it. You had to have a strong will to survive. That way. You felt you always felt you yes. would survive. Yes. Okay. Did did you give up ever? And your your brother pulled you through, or another friend pulled you through in in times. Oh, of there were times you tried to give up, but then last minute I said, "No, I'll make it. I will make it. I'll survive." Especially when my brother, when I knew he's, he was gone, I had a feeling that he must have either, when he escaped, he must have been shot. I said, I'm the only survivor. I've got to live. Okay. After you came back from the service in the United States Army, what did you do then? After I came back from the Army, of course, I met my wife here and we, we did it. I was. I didn't have a profession. I didn't, never had a chance to, uh, to learn anything. Uh, I was a travel a tra salesman. I became a house-to-house -house salesman. And that's what I did for about five or six years. When we got married, and I was selling sell from house to house. And then I decided, after five, six years, I went into furniture and appliance business. I opened up a little store and grew little by little. In. And that's what I've been doing all the time for about 30 years. I had a furniture and a closing store, an uh, appliance store. Um, last December, I just retired. That's, 
sold the business, the building, and I retired. I'm 65 now, so I figured I have no continuity. I have three children, and all of them are professionals. They don't need me. They don't need my business. So I said, well, a good offer came up. I sold it, and I enjoy life now. Okay. You mentioned that you took a trip back to see where you had been with your children. Yeah, we, we went. I, try, I want them to see Auschwitz. I want them to see my hometown. And it was very painful, very traumatic, but I felt a tremendous relief when I could see the go to the cemeteries. I have a picture here where I saw my father's mass graves, my mother's grave. I knew they, they were buried there. Well, there was hundreds of them, and we would say a prayer, say Kaddish, and it's a tremendous relief. And as a matter of fact, that my wife, myself, decided to go again. A lot of friends of mine tell me, why, why do you want to go? There's it's nothing there. The Polish, what are you, the Polish people, anti-Semitic? But I, I don't go to see those people. I don't care about those people. What I want to see is go to see. I just want to go again to the, to the cemetery and to visit all those places, even though it's very painful, but I just feel a relief. I can't explain. When your children were growing up, how could you communicate the experiences you had with them? Well, when they were little, we didn't go. But we did communicate when they got a little older. We, uh, we sat down with them we, and we talked to them, told them our experience and so far. They, they felt it because they never had any grand grandparents. They always used to ask ways, uh, how comes people have a like, grandfather, grandmother? We don't have any. So we explained to them. So they, they understood. They understood. Okay. When you think back, on all of your experiences and all the wisdom you've gained since then, mm -hmm. what message do you have to the world? Oh, the message, often I think about it, is that people forget, they forget what happened already. It's been, it's been only not even quite 50 years. That's the reason I, I even though it's painful to come here and talk about it, I really want, because I feel we contribute something for the future generation. People should see it, should hear it, should know what happened. Only by education and learning what happened, maybe it could avoid from happen again, such a tragedy for Jewish people. What brought back your humanity? You said that you had felt so inhuman, and people, what is it that brought well, you back to your other humanity. Frankly, I, it's a good question. I, I believe, I don't know. Maybe it's the depression and after I mean, after the war, once we, we feel we felt more like human beings, it comes back to you. While well, when you're with animals, you become an animal, and that's what an animal, and that's what actually it was. We were animals. Everybody was only for himself to survive. I mean, you can't blame people. People would kill for a piece of bread. We used to search at, at often pick up potato peels, and and we used to fight over it. It's, it's, I can't describe it how what, because you don't know what it means. Day and day, hunger, hunger. It's, it's, you're constantly 24 hours a day. You're always hungry hungry and you just think about it, you dream about it, and you mind you going crazy. And then you, especially when you see some other guy, when you see a man eat something, you are willing just to kill him, just to grab the piece of bread. It's, it's, I know people who went there can't understand it, but it is a fact. So getting back to a regular life. Yeah, we get back to regular life, we come back, I mean, after all, we are human. And a human being can become an animal. Can you forgive? I don't know. I've been thinking about it. Uh, it's hard to forgive. You can, you, you can forgive to some degree, but you can't forget it. 
You can forgive something, but you can't forget it. Okay. Thank you very much.